Hey everyone, I'm Cesar Condi, chairman of the NBC Universal News Group. I'm pleased that you're able to join us today for our second NBCU Academy Next Level Summit. Today, you will hear from some of the most talented people across our business who are bringing cutting edge content and technology across NBCU's wide array of news, sports, film, and entertainment programs. We are particularly proud to introduce you to journalists and leaders from NBC News, MSNBC, CNBC, Telemundo, and NBC Universal's owned and operated stations, as well as leaders from Universal Pictures, DreamWorks, Universal Filmed Entertainment Group, NBC Sports, and Telemundo Sports. Together, they are revolutionizing the art of storytelling and are eager to provide you with valuable advice to help advance your career. In a world that is becoming increasingly connected, our most sacred responsibility is to inform our audiences through the creation of content that reflects and represents all of the communities that we serve across all of our platforms. As part of that effort, the NBCU News Group recently marked the second anniversary of the 50% Challenge Initiative, which aspires to have one of every two news group team members be a person of color and one of every two be a woman. We're also aiming to provide greater geographic and socioeconomic diversity across our organization and build teams with greater diversity of experiences. I'm pleased to report that in all these areas, we continue to make steady progress, thanks to efforts like those of the NBCU Academy and the work of our partners in higher education. The Academy continues to bring the ideals of the initiative to life through events like today's summit, as well as its close collaboration with institutions of higher learning. I'm pleased to share that the NBCU Academy will be welcoming another 15 schools into the program this year, growing this year by 50% to include 45 institutions of higher learning. The Academy has also recently launched its second group of embeds. There are now 11 recent graduates who are working full-time across the news group and receiving mentoring and professional development. You'll be hearing from these impressive men and women who represent the next generation of journalists. With that, I'll leave you to be inspired by the insights and perspectives that the NBCU Academy has in store over the next few hours. Thank you again for participating in today's program. Can't stop now. We're better than ever. I'm going to give you a bird's eye view of the rocket designed to test our ability to go into deep space with a vehicle built for humans. Y ahora sí, fuerte el aplauso para mi son de We've got the eighth wonder of the news world, Steve Kornacki <laughs> at the big board. Dig a little bit deeper in terms of where the votes are coming in in this district. Here's what's happening at this hour on CNBC. Here come the undefeated Irish. Let's go. All the damage here and across this country is only convincing Ukrainians of the need to fight even harder or lose everything. Lifeguards are using drones to help keep people safer at the beach. Scientists are also using drones to better understand how people and sharks do and don't interact. They are super fast and a lot of fun. This is a rapid intensification storm. This is the big story. It's increased 85 miles per hour. Welcome to Super Bowl 56 on NBC. I'm Mike Tirico, and this is what we're here for. Hello, everyone. So good to have you with us. I'm Francis Rivera, coming to you live from our studios at 30 Rock in New York. That's just a taste of some of the cutting edge technology we're going to be showing you today. We are so excited to have you join us for NBCU Academy's second ever Next Level Summit, Tech, Digital, the Future is Here. Nearly 1,100 journalists, students, and media professionals tuned in for our first summit back in April. And today, more than 1,700 people have registered to attend this global virtual experience. Now our mission is to shine a light on all the ways technology is transforming the media landscape, whether it's news, entertainment, or sports, and give you knowledge on how to succeed. So charge your laptops, grab a snack, and strap in for an exciting day of hearing from trailblazers across the NBC Universal family and beyond. Here's what we have lined up. In just a few moments, CNBC's Shepard Smith will interview our top leaders about the future of news and how technology is changing their big picture strategy. Then you don't want to miss a dynamic discussion about the tech revolution and news. 
get a glimpse of our virtual 3A studio and see how technology is changing how we cover big events in the field, including the use of drones to help our storytelling. And speaking of major events, the midterm elections are exactly three weeks away, and NBC's Steve Kornacki will talk with one of the gurus behind the big board. And next, you'll get to choose between three virtual breakout sessions. There's Check the Source, NBC's Scotty Schwartz. We'll look at how NBC reporters are using social media to news gather. Antonia Hilton, co-host of the South Lake podcast, will lead a discussion on breakout careers in media and technology. And getting in the game, NBC Sports host Ahmed Farid will talk with leaders about how tech is transforming the way we view everything from the Olympics to the World Cup. And capping it all off after hearing from top tech leaders across NBC Universal, Senior Vice President of DEI for our news group, Yvette Miley, shares the mission, her best advice for using this information to take your career to the next level. And throughout the day, NBC News correspondents will be with students from two of our NBCU Academy partner schools asking questions of our panelists. Emily Aqueda is standing by with students at Howard University, and Priscilla Thompson is with students at the University of Texas Arlington. But that's not all. Later today, you'll have a chance to enter three career expo rooms. That's where you can potentially come on camera and ask questions about how to be an NBCU Academy embed, how to get a job in digital and tech, and what it takes to become a DreamWorks animator. So I'll see you back here in a bit, but for now, let me hand it over to my colleague, CNBC's Shepard Smith in our 6A studio in New York. Hey, Shep. Hi, Francis. Thanks very much, and hello to all of you. Throughout the day, you'll have the opportunity to interact with all of our panelists by dropping questions into the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. So you can go ahead and do that now if you want. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. So let's get started with our first panel of the day, looking at news and entertainment in the digital and streaming age in this hour top leaders from the NBC Universal News Group and Universal Pictures will share their vision for the future and their advice for succeeding in the new media environment. A little later on, Universal Pictures VP Annie Chang will demonstrate how video gaming technology is revolutionizing the entertainment industry. But right now, I want to introduce our distinguished guests, our power panel today, if you will, the president of MSNBC, Rashida Jones, NBC News President Noah Oppenheim, the CNBC President Casey Sullivan, and the Telemundo Station Group EVP of News, Ozzy Martinez. All my bosses. <laughs> <laughs> a perilous day ahead. Good to see Not all of you. <laughs> Let's start with a question really to all of you. I mean, what are some of the ways that technology has changed the way you lead in your news organization, Rashida? Might as well begin with you. Yeah, I mean, I think the timing for this couldn't be better. We're, we're on, um, in, on some level, the other side of uh, a long stretch of, of mostly everyone in the, or, in the organization working from home. And so the, just the fact that we've been able to take the work that many of us do into our living rooms and our kitchens and our bedrooms, um, I think has changed the future of the business. I think it's not only uh, allowed for the hybrid state that we're in now, but it's allowed for more flexibility um, in how we create and, de de and deliver the news. I also think it gave us all a crash course in how people consume the news outside of the news business. It's not just one screen, one device, one platform. By being consumers at home in a different way, it's also opened up, I think, um, a, a better perspective of how the general public consumes content. Hmm. Yeah. Any, anybody else? I, I think Rashida uh, hit, hit it right on the nose. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic was really eye-opening on a number of levels. Um, there were a lot of technologies that we were in the process of embracing and the acceleration of that embrace over the course of the past two years has really changed our trajectory. And it, you see its impact in a couple of ways. One, um, you know, I'll be blunt, efficiencies, right? We've realized that we can cover stories thanks to technology with far fewer resources, right? So if you're an executive producer or you're an editor of some kind and you're sitting there trying to decide where am I gonna deploy correspondents and reporters, it used to be if you were gonna to commit to cover a story, that meant a significant investment, both in terms of money, manpower, et cetera. Now you can send one person with an iPhone 
and go cover that story. So that opens up the world of possibilities of what stories we can tell, what stories we can take chances on, um, and I think really impactful ways. And then the other piece of it are those distribution channels, as Rashida mentioned, the ways in which other our audience is consuming news. We realize now there are there are all of these new platforms in which we can push our content out on, and and it's just the the storytelling possibilities that you find in that are enormous. One of those is our streaming channel, NBC News Now, which has just been incredible. Increases of 55% since just last year. Talk, talk about the importance of streaming and digital to NBC's future. Sure. Well, I think it's it's no it's no secret. Streaming is the future when it comes to the media business generally, mm -hmm. both in the entertainment category and in the news category. Uh, for us, we launched NBC News Now uh, in 2019, and we made a couple of what I think were pretty important decisions. One, we decided to make it free, and and two, we decided to try to push it out on as many platforms as possible and try to make it ubiquitous so that if you were consuming your video content on, a, a, on Roku, on a smart Samsung TV, via Apple TV, or on Peacock, NBC Universal streaming platform, or just on NBCnews.com, you can get NBC News now. And what we've seen in the last few years is an enormous explosion in terms of audience growth, um, such that we've got you know 100 million views per month now, 30 million hours viewed, um, and thankfully we're now the number one streaming news platform. We're exceeding the audiences of ABC and CBS's news streaming platforms. Uh, we all know what happened to CNN Plus, um, and so we are we have emerged as a leader in the field, and we continue to launch more programming on that. Uh, on that streaming service, and we're reaching a totally new audience. We're reaching an audience that is much younger than the traditional television audience was, people who are in their 30s and 40s, whereas the cable and broadcast audience tends to be a bit older than that. On broadcast, we always try to get the length of tune up. Is it, is it a similar sort of equation online? Their folks are watching for, on average, around an hour. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Great. It's yep. a big number. Uh, local news, when you watch on linear, we're, we're having people only watch about seven minutes of a local newscast on broadcast. On streaming, I mean, half an hour, 28 minutes. It's amazing the, the potential that's there. Advertisers love that. <laughs> Rashida, we have some pre-submitted questions from people all over our news group, including Great. one from a Peacock employee named Jeremy Garrison. Jeremy, thank you. I feel like Larry King. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, Jeremy asked, the future of news on streaming services is unknown. What do you think it will look like down the road? So I think um, there are a lot, there, there's a lot unknown about where streaming um, takes news, but we also know a lot. You know, Noah spoke a lot about the success that we've seen for News Now. I think is, is part of the news group, it's given us incredible information about viewer consumption, about where people are consuming this content, how they are. I think we don't know how quickly content will migrate and, and what speed um, it will migrate to streaming. We know it's migrating there. We're seeing, uh, especially on the cable side, audience sizes decline, and we're, we know they're going somewhere, and in a lot of cases, they're going to streaming. So I think uh, as we look ahead to the future, and, and the future in a lot of cases is now, again, when you look at News Now as a case study and the success that News Now is seeing, we know that trend will continue. And I think for us, because we're able uh, within the news group to see not only that success, we know that's where the where the, directionally we're going. We know we want to hedge our bets and where the future holds, but we also want to protect our core. We want to make sure the content that we're delivering every single day maintains a high standard, a high level, and high performance. And so we're kind of in this in-between period where we both have to protect our core businesses, but also look for ways to innovate for the future. You know, as con content creators, yeah. It seems to me the platform doesn't matter quite as much. Mm -hmm. And we need good ideas, good characters, Absolutely. and stories well told. I, 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 think, yeah. I think actually, though, technology has, has fragmented audiences, which means I think content is more important than ever. I think really knowing who your brand is, yep. how you hit that mark, matters more and more. Because, because those audiences are fragmented, they want, they want what they want, and you need to deliver that. So I think actually it doubling down on content and the quality of content is even more important than ever. Mm -hmm. Casey, how, how knowledgeable do journalists need to be about technology to do their jobs now? I, th I, think, I think technology is, is uh, it, it, it's just part of, of what they do. I think if you look at how we used to cover news 15 years ago with a, a heavy truck uh, to now the access you can get with the live view and, and where technology is going, you're able to get into the field in a way you were never able to do before. Uh, the way that you use things like uh, news gathering, things like Twitter and, and, and things like that, those are just just so uh, embedded in, in how our journalists uh, work. I was at Squawk Box this morning um, and I was talking to the EP there and, and, and we, we were talking about the importance of 
of uh, audience feedback and understanding the pulse of what the audience is feeling and taking that as a consideration uh, as they think about the, the, the programming overall. Um, so I think technology overall is, it, it, it feeds every part from news gathering to storytelling to, to you know, how we measure and, and look at news overall. I think it also breeds innovation. It, it just opens the door for people to come up with different ways to tell stories, different stories to tell, different ideas, and also perhaps to reach communities that you wouldn't normally uh, have access to if it weren't for your ability to communicate with, touch folks on the ground in places that maybe are hard to get to. And don't ever say what, what's old is never new again. I mean, a perfect example, last night on Nightly, Gotti Schwartz piece, yeah. done all on film, using all kinds of new ways to shoot things, but using an old standby in film. I, I, love, I haven't thought about film in the soup for <laughs> longer than I want to admit to being alive, honestly. Ozzy, one for you. Uh, take a listen to this question from uh, Jayla Myers from Kaplan University, here. My question is, how do you guys keep up with producing new content as well as appeal to your target audience? Well, good morning to you, Jayla, and to everyone in South Carolina. I would say that... I get it wrong. It's Claflin. I'm sorry, Jayla. <laughs> uh, oh, well, she's, she's saying good morning back. Don't worry. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. She's all good. Um, thank you for the question. I would say, you know, at the end of the day, we want to continue to focus on what we do, right? We're serving our communities. We're going out. We're telling stories um, from folks who would not otherwise get representation. So I would say our focus is, continues to be that. Um, storytelling, good journalism... Uh, no matter what technologies come along, uh, uh, it's what we need to continue to, to do. Noah, uh, one for you as well. This question from Montclair State University and their senior, Kayla McCullough. Listen. My question is, how can journalists maintain credibility and avoid manipulation when using new technology to tell stories? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, listen, the, the, this, new, this new landscape of, of, of social media has, has really been both a blessing and a curse in terms of news gathering um, for, for our journalists, right? Our access to information is quicker, um, it's wider, it's no longer about sort of working a telephone tree of sources. Um, it's all right there at your fingertips. But so, too, is the opportunity to be manipulated, misled, um, and go down the rabbit hole of, of conspiracy theories and misinformation and disinformation. And so the ability to kind of parse that um, has never been more important. And we're only just getting started, uh, unfortunately. I mean, when you talk to people about the future of deep fakes and other ways in which um, we might get misled by technology in the future, I, I fear that it's only going to grow more perilous. And so... Um, you know, you mentioned film and everything that's old is new again. Well, same thing goes for journalistic ethics mm -hmm. and the old school practices of checking, double checking, double sourcing, triple sourcing. Um, just be sure uh, it's more important to be right than to be first. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an important thing to remind her. I tell everybody, trust no one, not even your mother. <laughs> <laughs> double check everything, everything at all, triple check it. Mom. <laughs> even mom. The, the ways we get it to people who consume it have changed, but the rules for what we do right. are constant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, so it's so great that you guys are participating. And we've got a question here from one of our viewers tuned in online. Madeline Nagler asks, with the modern media diet being so relentless, how do you individualize the value of the stories that you're telling and communicate that value to consumers? That's a good question. That's Thank you. Question. Hmm. I'll call back to something uh, Casey said about um, kind of cl not clarifying, but finding the value proposition for your audience, right? Like I think in a world where there's a lot of content, a lot of choices, um, being very clear on what your brand is and what you offer is a way to create relevancy. If you try to be all things to all people, a lot of times you can put yourself in a situation where um, your content's not as relevant. Your your direction isn't is, is clear and the audience isn't as clear on what the value proposition is. And so especially for, you know, 24-hour networks where we're always on, there's a lot of content, not to mention our streaming platforms, not to mention our web platforms. I think you have to be really clear on what your brand value is. I also think, especially in Spanish language, doing stories that empower the community, uh, registering to vote, things that people may not know about at the end of the day go a very long way, uh, especially in local news. So I think that's another great uh, area to focus in on, things that are going to empower us uh, and the folks we're serving. 
Mm -hmm. And Casey, I guess in our, in our case, you know, you, what you're doing is trying to get people an opportunity to make wise decisions for their families and their businesses. Mm -hmm. And wrapping up technology that's just streaming into our place now is crucial. Absolutely, and, and, and look, I think uh, a, a key tenant of, of CNBC and our brand is, is being actionable. And I think the uh, speed at which we're able to get information from technology allows us to, to, to meet that need. Um, and I think then a, a discipline of you know, really hammering home who we are and, and how we deliver that message and staying on point there. Casey, talk to me about how advances in technology have allowed you to better understand your audience at CNBC. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned the Squawk Box example this morning of, of uh, where Twitter has, uh, you know, was a, a, an ability to get a real-time pulse uh, of that. I think um, as more and more of our audience consumes our content uh, online and through digital uh, platforms, we're able to understand better because the data we get back is, is better uh, on what's resonating, uh, why it's resonating. Um, so technology has been a, a, a huge uh, enabler of, of kind of flipping the lights on for us to see, be able to see what what really is resonating with our audience. Um, so th those have been some of the big big helps. There was a time when we had to wait for the book to come out to even <laughs> know what they liked and didn't like. Yeah, You get it immediately now. Yeah, It was simpler, but this is actually helpful. It's true. All right, uh, Priscilla, are you ready? I'm ready. I want to get to Priscilla Thompson. I want to head over to NBCU Academy's partner school, the University of Texas at Arlington. And Priscilla's there with a crowd of students. Hey, Priscilla. Hey, Chef, I'm here with Ron Everett. He is a senior broadcast communications major, hoping to pursue a career as a correspondent or a documentarian. And Ron has a question. Hey, Rashida, documentaries are some of the most watched formats on watch. streaming platforms currently. What does the future of documentary style content look like for MSNBC? Sure, so we are very focused on finding stories that not only fit our brand, um, are connected to our content but but evolve the conversation so a lot of what we focused on with msnbc films are stories that we would normally be talking about on air but we look for stories that bring a deeper meaning and a deeper perspective we're lucky in that we have a partner with nbc news studios and that they know our brand they know our culture they know our content and we partner with studios we partner with with other production houses but we really try to focus on how can we take the stories that we're covering every day and bring a different perspective bring it to a different audience in a lot of cases um, um, and, and add just that level of depth that you don't normally get to do in daily programming. In a world where news is breaking every minute, every hour, this allows us to stop down and in longer form tell some of those stories that wouldn't necessarily be told with that level of depth. And what we're seeing is not only are we bringing in a lot of new audience, people who don't normally consume our brand or don't normally watch uh, live uh, news, they're finding us through these documentaries. And I think this, it's only the beginning. We want to continue to do that, continue to grow that, and continue to find ways to tell different stories. I, I saw Nicole Wallace on with on Matt o Monday, yep. talking about her new venture. It seems like they're getting, we're getting new verticals everywhere. I mean, I think part of it is people are multi-dimensional, right? And so you, if, you know Nicole as a um, very thoughtful political brain. She's got two hours a day where she can live in the news of the day and, and really dissect, dissect and help the audience understand. But there's so much more to Nicole. And, and the series that she just launched uh, yesterday is focused on mental health. And so through the voices of the Lindsey Vaughns of the world and the Taraji P. Hensons of the world, she's not only bringing a different side of her and a different perspective, but it's, it's more representative of the totality who she is. And I think for an audience that has learned to trust her through one lens, it, it just exposes them through a different lens here. Yeah, and it. all of that content on Peacock. And again, to have a place where we can bring our content exclusively to where we know audiences are going is just something that we're really lucky to have. Yep, brave new world. Hey, our correspondent Emily Aketa is with students at Howard University. Emily, I hear it's homecoming week Howard around there. University. Emily, I hear it's homecoming week around there. That's right, and it is the first one that is held in person for several years. So this campus is just buzzing with excitement. I can't wait to share some of the really inquisitive questions from this great group of students. First up, we have Carla Dozier. She's graduating in just a few months. One of the things she's really interested in is editing videos for social media. The basis of your question, Carla, what would you like to ask? Good morning. My question is, with the growth of social media, there's been an increase in citizen journalism. Why is it still important for students to seek professional training and education to go into the journalism field? Noah? Sure. Uh, thanks, Carla. Uh, I think that's a great question. And we sort of, you know, alluded to it earlier when talking about the 
the, the dangers that exist um, in, in social news gathering. Um, you know, I, I think, listen, there, there is a, an important role for citizen journalists. Uh, so much of the coverage that we do, particularly during big breaking news events, uh, oftentimes we're grabbing the first video, not from an affiliate, but from, uh, from user generated, um, you know, social media uh, content. So, you know, we, we now have an army of journalists, every one of which has a, has a camera in their pocket, uh, and that allows us to, to, to learn about events in real time in ways that uh, obviously were impossible before. Before. But uh, being able to take out your phone and start filming uh, is only the first step in the process of, of storytelling and more importantly, at getting, in, getting to the truth. Uh, that's a longer, harder uh, process in, in which professional training and, and, and study really does play an important role because so often our, our first impressions of something are not frankly accurate or don't tell the full story and so how do you then go from that first bit of video or that first bit of sort of citizen journalist content and build out the context around it dig deeper ask those important questions that help us really get to the, the core of the truth that's our real job um, uh, you know that's where the training comes in handy that's where internships come in handy study comes in handy um, and that's why it's so important that, that you're doing what you're doing and having someone double checking you and, and, and uh, you know, bringing balance, it's, it's, it's hard in a 60 second clip, right? Yeah. If, if what you're doing is just simply uh, speaking uh, your mind, right? Uh, bringing balance is very important to everything we do and uh, uh, you need those editors. <laughs> yeah, we all do. Yeah. Ozzy, how has technology helped spread news in Spanish language news? Oh, technology has been fundamental for the growth of Spanish language television. Uh, broadband technology, we could go, we talked about it earlier, right? Uh, we can go live from anywhere now. We can go to Russia and cover the World Cup and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it would have been cost prohibitive, right? We could do that now. In New Mexico, on the Telemundo station side, we, we literally launched a television station in about six months. And we're going live every day using a laptop as a control room. Mm. I mean, in the old days, you would need to, <laughs> how long would that take, right? So it's been a huge uh, positive for, for our ability to go out into our communities uh, because it's, 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 it's financially uh, feasible now to do it, yeah. We have a question from the audience, an anonymous question that's interesting. Oh. Uh, it's from one of our viewers tuned in online, thank you. Uh, you can you share something oh. that brings you joy in your role? <laughs> <laughs> We should each get into this. That's great. Yeah, I Chef, like you that. start. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, a very good lunch room. <laughs> Gosh, for, for me, um, and I'm not just saying this because we're here at NBCU Academy and we've got tons of students watching, um, but it's hearing from the folks who are going to take our roles in a couple of years. It's hearing from the next generation of journalists. It's seeing what you're interested in, pouring into how can we contribute um, as a public service to growing this field, um, you know, seeing the students uh, on campuses across the country that we have represented here, but I would say also specifically a lot of the HBCUs represented. Howard students and happy homecoming to you guys. You guys can't see it, but one of our camera guys has on an NCANT <laughs> sweatshirt. I went to Hampton, but to see the amount of students who are coming up the ranks, becoming passionate about this industry, learning about it, and eventually will we'll, we'll rule this industry, I'm really excited and, and joyful about that. I think for me, it's, it's seeing that process of a pitch becoming a story, that going through, watching somebody sort of raise their hand with passion, with enthusiasm and say, hey, I think there's something here, we should go and tell this story, then watching them go out and do it and see it come to fruition in the form of a nightly piece or a Today Show piece or NBC News Now mini doc or whatever it is, and then the impact that that then has in the world and just, you know, the, the idea from, from idea stage to execution to impact, and then the reaction of the person who came up with it and being a conduit to help them do that is just, that's always fun. For me, I, you know, I think, um, I'd love Rashida's answer. Uh, Aunt knows too, but Rashida's answer. I, thought, <laughs> I, think, I, I, think, I, I do think that, that the, seeing the, the uh, pipeline of talent that's coming through the, yeah. the businesses and a, and a huge credit that we're doing this today. Um, but one thing I, I get a lot of joy on, and, and now coming back a month ago to, to the news group, is, is getting in the field with the, the team. I, I feel like um, we, we did a, a Delivering Alpha big event. Uh, we did a lot of programming from there. We did a, a, a whole event uh, schedule with the, our events team. Um, and the brand just dazzled. And people, when they're in the field, there's an energy. 
uh, when they're um, they're chasing a story and, and it's I, I just I love I love seeing that from uh, a, a junior producer to uh, on-air talent to uh, the the marketing and communication teams that are supporting it's it just it's, it's wonderful to see the whole organization get behind something Quickly, Ozzy. I love my job. Two quick things. Uh, being part of a team that involves Spanish language news. Love that. But more importantly, as I get older, <laughs> quote unquote, is the impact that you get to see uh, folks who come in early career and seeing how they grow and evolve every day is, is, uh, brings me joy. Here's a good one. What, what are some tips that you could share for a soon to be college graduate to become part of our NBC News Universal family? Learn and build your network. Learn new skills, new technology, and build your network. Say no to nothing. Every, it's a stepping stone. You know, you're just getting in the door. Get in. Yeah. And the answer is always yes. Where, <laughs> where am I going? How long will I be there? Right. Let's go. Yeah. Yes. OK, uh, one for each of you pre-submitted question, uh, which we have on the screen. And it's from Stephanie Passos. She's a student from the University of Florida. Oof. What does the, I, I say oh. that, my old, that's oh. my Ole Miss roots coming up. Sorry. <laughs> what does the future of journalism look like and how can students prepare now to thrive as professionals? Rashida, let's begin with you. Um, learn the technology and I'll also piggyback off of something um, that Noah said here and I know you've been a big advocate of, learn the core skills. Learn the old school version of storytelling and journalism and it'll take you far. Um, I'll say, in addition to those core skills, and I think I said it at the, next, the last Next Level Summit, it helps to have some sort of expertise, right? I mean, general, you know, general journalism skills are great, but I think there's no greater advantage than being able to walk in the door and to tell your boss, not only do I know the basics of journalism, not only do I know the technology, but it also so happens that I know a lot, I took a minor in finance or, or I studied political science and know everything there is to know about politics in the state of Florida, for instance. Um, have some subject matter that you're really good at in addition and that I think gives you a leg up. Uh, I, I think mine would be look, look for somebody who's gonna give you real feedback. Uh, someone who's gonna tell you not just the wonderful things that you're doing, but, but gives you that critical feedback of construct, in a constructive way. Make sure you become a necessity, or once you get into that first job especially, uh, as you said, uh, Noah, you want to know a little bit about everything, right? Uh, Editorial-wise, but also behind the scenes as well. And if you're lucky, people will try to help you get better. Right. And if you take that in the spirit with which it was given, you, you know, the sky's the limit. It's, it's just not personal. We, yeah. Every single day is a day to get better. Ozzy, another pre-submitted question. Executive producer Candace Barnett asks, how do you stay on the front edge of the constant evolution of news? Ooh, Ooh there's um, a challenge. Be open, <laughs> get ready. Uh, be uh, ready and willing to pivot quickly, right? Because technology is changing every day. We talked about three months ago, it could, there could be a new thing right now. So, um, so make sure you, you embrace change and uh, uh, know that, uh, hey, it's not personal as we were talking about earlier. What we thought worked yesterday is not working today. It's not, we gotta change. Yeah. yeah. Tatum from New Mexico State calling in and with a question about reporting news in a digital universe. Take a listen. These past couple of years have shed light on the impact of user preference and the social media algorithm. How can upcoming journalists create meaningful stories while preparing for the growing environment of misinformation and oversaturation? Misinformation, that, that's going to be a challenge for everyone in this industry. It is, and I, you know, I think we've, we've spoken to it again. It comes down to um, you know, those old school journalistic ethics. It comes down to a good editor. Um, it comes down to always upholding the organization's values and standards um, and not cutting corners. Um, you know, there's, I think, a temptation, particularly with the pace of social media and, and, and news distribution nowadays that, you know, you feel like you need to break a story immediately. You've got to be first. Obviously, we all want to be first, but it's far more important to be to be right. And I think there's a there's a real temptation sometimes to say, oh, we, th we know this is true. Come on. It's on Twitter. Everyone's saying it. Let's just go with it. Um, but that's where um, you get into trouble. Maybe not every time, but once you start cutting those corners once, it's a very slippery slope. Um, and so, you know, at least here we believe in, in upholding those standards always. Mm -hmm. I say be careful about your passion. It's great to have passion, but you could have too much passion with a story and not check yourself. So I think mm -hmm. that's uh, very important. That's why we go back to the editor. <laughs> you need an editor. Yeah, we all do. Hey, Priscilla's uh, still at the University of uh, Texas at Arlington, and a student there has a question, I understand. Hey, Priscilla. 
That's right. I'm here with Jeanette Pardo. She is a junior here at UT Arlington. And Jeanette, I'll let you take it away. Um, when and how did you know what career path you wanted to take? <laughs> I, I mean, I was watching Elvis's funeral when I was 13, and they had a live camera. They'd never had that before in the little town where I was. Yeah. And I was like, wow, my parents don't seem to agree on the Vietnam War, yeah. so I can go, because we can now go there live, and I can cover it. Yeah. Huh. That's how I decided. I, the rest of it was just dumb luck. But what about, <laughs> what about the rest of you? I knew from elementary school that I wanted to be a writer. Um, I didn't know until I got to college that you could write for television. And mm -hmm. so from my third week of college, 17 years old, I knew this was the field I wanted to go in. You have a thousand fields. <laughs> I still don't know. I still haven't figured out one that's going to stick. Um, I, I mean, not dissimilarly, I've always loved writing, um, and it turns out that I'm really rotten at sports, so the school newspaper uh, <laughs> turned out to be a good place to hang out. Um, and I never stopped hanging out at newspapers or some form of them. Um, mine, I, I, I read a, a book early in my career, uh, Smartest Guys in the Room, about when uh, Enron blew up, and it just became a passion area that I found a thread to follow and found my way to, to CNBC. It was the Gulf War. The fact that you could see a live, a, a war happening live with all those streaks, if you guys remember, to me was fascinating and I wanted to be part of that. Wow. Yeah, I, I, we all we were touching on that, had to have been back at the time. Now it's like, what's the next thing? How are we about to communicate? We, most, we have the fundamentals of how to do it, yeah. but where and how are we gonna do it, you know? I think it continues to be more personal, more um, immersive, what that looks like. Hopefully someone watching will create the technology to do so, but yeah. Yeah, another question from our viewers, and thank you again. What advice do you have for journalists entering the political world? Mm. Mm. I like what Ozzy yeah, said about checking your passion. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one, and I think um, you, you, you have to be passionate about the topic, but passionate, but, but check the passion against your own biases and, and perspectives. And so I think that's important. But I also think, you know, politics is a broad topic and, and it, you know, it covers a lot of, of real estate. And so just immersing yourself in local, state, regional, national, perhaps even international, it's just immersion of the content, but also checking your passion. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. There's a there's a big distinction between journalism and advocacy that sometimes gets lost nowadays. And so I think particularly if you're covering politics, understanding that distinction between journalism and advocacy is important. Um, and then I'll throw in there just to be, again, the stodgy old guy. Like, you know, I'm like the same age. Study. <laughs> 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 study, study, study politics and study the history, right? You know, the races that we're covering now are not the first races that have ever been run. And the dynamics that we're seeing unfold uh, in our political landscape, uh, they're certainly new in, in, in some ways, but they're very old in others. And so having a little bit of that historical context and actual baseline knowledge, I think, is helpful. It's always fun to see Chuck Todd act like he's seen this movie before. <laughs> which well, he has. Usually yeah. he has. Yeah. Guys, this was fun. Yeah. Rashida, Noah, Casey, Will you have Ozzie. us back? Uh, well, this is your home, so. <laughs> <laughs> I serve at the pleasure of the president. <laughs> have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks to all of our leaders across the news group, uh, and we're going to have a great day ahead. These have been our kickoff for now. But now, technology and innovation aren't just shaping the future of news. They're also fueling the entertainment industry. Let's bring in Annie Chang now, Universal Pictures VP of Creative Technology. She's coming to us from Studio H in Los Angeles. How are you? That's right. I'm great. Thank you, Shep. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, that was really great to hear from our senior leaders. Um, so we're going to take a look at our first bit of technology for today, uh, and that is called virtual production. And that is buzzing all across NBCU. It is a very popular topic. Uh, virtual production is where we combine real physical things with computer generated and virtual type of things together while we shoot in production. And we're gonna cover this more so in the film and television world, but then this also 
has application in the broadcast world as well. So pay attention, please. Um, so if we zoom out for a second, you'll see that I'm on a stage here, stage H, uh, with something that looks like a giant television behind me. Um, this is an LED wall, and we're going to talk about this technology. I also have one above me as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about how all of this works and all of that. So um, I can basically put anything on the back of this wall to make it look like I'm anywhere you can imagine. So um, uh, in the past, we've actually used matte painting, and re and um, uh, sorry <laughs> and um, uh, rear projection to put out backgrounds um, or we may have used a green screen or a blue screen that we would replace later with the actual background um, so in this case what I can do is let's say I want to be in wisteria Lane uh, over in the Universal backlot Bing here I am um, and but now if you notice when the camera starts to move here, uh, you'll see that uh, it's just a still image. You can tell because the picket fence behind me is not really moving, the house isn't really moving and changing perspective. Um, and so that's what makes it look like, oh, I'm just like a news anchor with in front of some kind of uh, image there. But we can fix this. We can actually use something called a video game engine uh, to create a real-time rendered version of the background for me to make it look like I'm, I'm really actually here. Video game engine is what the technology that's used to make video games. And let's take a look at a short video that explains what video game engine is and how we use it to visualize scenes before we shoot. In many modern video games, your game character is moving around and interacting with a virtual world or environment like these dinosaurs are in Jurassic World Evolution 2. Building a video game world is very much like building a set and having actors walk around. We took scans and photos of our Europe Street backlot location in Universal City and then built a version of it in Unreal Game Engine, comprised of many buildings as shown here from above. Unreal is the same video game engine used to make Fortnite and many other video games. Once this Europe Street world was built in Unreal, we can walk around in it, just like we can in the real world. The scale of the virtual version is set up to match the real life version, and sometimes it can be hard to tell them apart. In addition, we can place virtual cameras like this one following the actress, just like you would in the real world to capture footage from a certain perspective. We can use these virtual cameras to help visualize a scene, allowing filmmakers to figure out shots before they shoot in real life. The virtual cameras in these game engines can mimic real world cameras and lenses. To illustrate this, let's say we want to imitate a car chase sequence from a Fast and Furious movie. Using game controllers, we can drive the cars down the street to get the motion of the chase. Then we place cameras with different lenses and effects from the back of the cars or from different angles. Then we edit the shots together in Unreal to build the sequence. What's cool is that after the fact, we can go back and adjust things in the sequence, like changing out the blue car to a Dodge Hellcat, all in real time and on the fly. Video game engines and real time rendering are super powerful. They include physics simulations, weather, and even time of day changes that mimic real life. Here, you'll see a comparison of the same date and time in the Europe Street game engine and in real life. You can see that the shadows between the two look almost identical. The similarity between game engine outputs and real life helps filmmakers trust that what they see in game engine will be what they see in the real world. Game engine technology and virtual production can be a great tool for visualizing locations and scenes ahead of actual physical production. Now, let's demonstrate how they can be used on LED walls. Now let's take a look at how we can use game engine technology with our LED walls. I'm here at the Ritzy Cinema Cafe and Cafe uh, in London, and it's a nice, bright, sunny day, maybe around lunchtime. Um, and as you can tell, I maybe look a little bit more real than I did before when I was in a Mysteria Lane. Um, let's break this all down and talk about how we do this. Um, so I have some props here in the foreground and also in the midground to kind of help sell the scene. Um, and then everything else for the background is on the LED wall. If we zoom out again, you'll see that there's a large rectangle that's moving around a little bit on that LED wall. That rectangle is called a frustrum. The frustrum is a place where the camera actually sees what it's going to be shooting and capturing. So it's the highest quality render that we have inside of this rectangle. And so uh, the rectangle moves around the LED screen, and so you'll see that it actually still moves around a portion of this ritzy uh, cinema asset. Um, and that's because it's providing us some consistent lighting for reflections. Uh, 
Now I'd like to introduce Horst Sarubin from my team, who's going to talk a little bit about what's inside the frustrum and how, why it makes things look real. Thanks, Annie. Uh, so what's inside the frustrum? I like to think that it's movie magic. So what, what I mean by that is everything that we're doing here is in service of helping you, the audience, suspend your disbelief. When you do that, you get into the characters, you feel the movie, and our job as technologists is to help with that, help our production crews. So what we're trying to do with the background is, is make you believe that we're somewhere that we're not. When, uh, when Annie was mentioning old technology, old is new again. You know, we have rear projection, all those things. The problem that we saw in front of Wisteria Lane is that as we move left or right, it didn't quite work. Something in it was like, oh, what's, that doesn't, doesn't fit. And that's because of an optical effect called parallax. And it's really easy to, to understand. You, you line your fingers up in front of one eye, you close one eye, and then you move your head left to right. And what's happening, you'll notice, pretty simple, the foreground and the background fingers are moving, you know, they're not stuck together, they're moving separately from one another. And that's what informs us about depth. So what does that all have to do with the frustrum? Well, instead of having a single 2D image, we are, when we move the frustrum back and forth, you'll see in the wide shot, changing that perspective. It's best seen in, inside the frustrum, that inside picture of picture, where you see the awning of the bar and the tickets. You notice that it's going, the ticket sign's going behind the awning, and you'd never get that on a 2D image. If you see it through the uh, cinema camera, it probably looks like I could just step in and walk all the way down uh, the corner here and go around the corner from Ritzy. So, and that's done specifically with having the frustrum designed for this camera here. So that's, the, that's how we pull off this movie magic to transport us into London in the daytime. Thanks, Horst. And in addition, uh, so what we have is this Ritzy asset is like the Europe Street asset that you just saw in the video. It's actually a 3D model that includes streets and buildings and lots of different stuff, and we're only seeing a portion of the actual scene. And this 3D world can be basically overlaid on top of our stage, and uh, everything kind of has a one-to-one -one match between the real world and the game engine world. And so what we do is we have a virtual camera inside the game engine that matches the placement of the real camera. Uh, so that can always stay in sync. So, Horace, can you talk a little bit about how we actually sync up the virtual and the real cameras? Uh, sure, absolutely. So it's through a technology called motion tracking. And we can uh, motion track anything. We can motion track people, props, or we can motion track cameras. So this is a cinema camera. It's what you've been seeing. Uh, it's what we shoot any movie on. And this uh, funny-looking device on the top with these white orbs, that's part of how we track it. We've got infrared cameras in the ceiling, and they calculate where this camera is at any given time, what angle it is. We also get information from the camera to see exactly how wide the lens would be. And that tells the game engine what to put on the wall and what to put the frustrum and where to put it. Um, you'll see something like this, a different way to do it with our, our colleagues at MSNBC later. Um, all this technology is advancing rapidly, and it's really exciting. But what I do to help me kind of understand it, you know, I always try to relay it back to things that, that I, I relate to better. All we're doing, so go back to the game engine. When you play a video game at home and you're doing like a first person, you're going through a maze and you move the controller around, when you move that controller, it changes the perspective on your TV. So what we've done here is we've turned this camera into a giant game controller. And the frustrum on the wall behind us, that's what would be on the TV. So as our camera crew moves it around, they're basically playing a video game for us. That's right. Thank you, Horst. So, uh, Game Engine is pretty powerful, and uh, as we uh, said in the video, you can just, with a click of a button, change the time of day. So, let's change this now to a nighttime sequence. We'll change also the lighting in the stage as well to make it uh, a little darker here. And now we can actually show you something that's really cool, and the reason why you would have an LED uh, above you is the reflections that you get. So, you can see with these shiny objects and also with glass that you get these lovely natural reflections. But a lot of our productions like shooting with green screen still. So what we could do is we can still change the frustrum to green if we want, like that. <laughs> Magic. And uh, now, though, you'll see that the green uh, reflects on everything. We have green spill yeah. on stuff. It's just a mess. Yeah, and this actually points out one of the hardest things in current uh, visual effects pipelines. We have to replace everything that's green with a realistic representation of the world. That includes the physics of like the prism effect that you get here behind the water, all the reflections, this green glass, and that would be really, really hard to do. If I was on that film, I'd be like, no, no, make everything matte. You know, I don't want to have to replace any of that. Yes, that would really suck. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> what we could do now, if we switch it back to the Ritzy asset again, uh, you'll see that we actually get these natural, lovely reflections for free, and that's what's really helpful. Yeah, and uh, everything. 
the prismatic effect you there, you see. Yep. All of this is the real physics happening in real time, and that helps sell it to the audience. Yeah, so let's take a now deeper look at uh, the game engine, and now I'd like to introduce Tim Ciancio, who's going to show you some extra features about game engine on the game engine interface. Tim? Thanks, Annie. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little brief tour of some of the tools that are embedded within side of Unreal Engine that give me control of everything that you're seeing happening in our LED wall. So as Annie had mentioned, it's very easy to um, change time of day or any kind of setting that you have in your virtual environment. So I'm going to go back to loading up a daytime scene. With the click of a mouse, you're already changed the entire uh, look and, and feel of your scene and then we match lighting on set to coincide with uh, that look. So once I'm in the game engine, I have a bunch of tools at my disposal, and one of the most powerful is being able to change lighting. Uh, so it's rendering in real time, so if I take control of the direction of the sun here, you'll notice as I rotate this, you're seeing all of the shadows change in perspective to this new positioning of the sun. So this allows you to be able to shoot at any time of day for as long as you need to, which is a huge benefit in virtual production compared to uh, the constraints of having to shoot with the timetable of the day. Um, another huge feature is being able to uh, change the position in your environment. In traditional production, if you wanted to shoot in another position or location, you'd have to break down your camera and your lighting and move your entire cast and crew to a new location. With virtual production, you can just basically move the position of your virtual camera. If I wanted to shoot a reverse, I've completely reversed the angle that we're shooting in to another place in our same environment. That saves a lot of time and a lot of, of money in having to spend your day moving around in, uh, from one location to another. Um, one of the other cool features is, is having your actual props in the foreground your practical props and lighting. Um, you might notice that Horse is on set right now and standing in front of a giant trash can. Oops. So that trash can is practically a, a real, a real uh, trash can. In the, in the virtual world, I have a 3D model that I've imported into the game engine of a very similar trash can. And you'll notice that I can move this around in real time. And this gives me the creative control to move props around in the environment that kind of complement the scene to however it best suits the composition of the framing of the camera. So this gives you a lot of flexibility with um, the game engine to make any creative decisions on the fly as you're shooting or in pre-production uh, to follow along with sto uh, story, the telling of the story for the camera. Um, and Annie, I'll toss it back to you. Great, thanks Tim. So uh, just real quick before we open up for questions, wanted to mention since we're talking about careers, uh, this is early days here in virtual production, and there are there, we we need people. We, there is no talent pipeline at this point, but we're working on it to have uh, you know, people work in this space that understand this thing. So if, for example, you like video games, um, you know it's a great way to actually get into game development, maybe, or even uh, getting uh, a little taste of Unreal or Unity. They're both free. You can download them. There's a Lot of tutorials online that you can play around with and so um, it's a it's a great time to actually get into this space absolutely yep so all right um, so I know we're probably running a little long so Shep um, do we have any questions that we could answer Andy that was meantime? wild I, I, I think that everyone watching this should know the last 10 to 15 minutes all of that was live everything they just did was done on the fly it, it, it's amazing to me that you can that you can do that. I mean, you're cheating, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> it's movie magic. <laughs> well, it's it's Definitely very magical. Movie magic. I, I want to go back, yeah. start over in, in a technologically advanced world, and figure out how to do any. I feel like even the metaverse could benefit from this because that metaverse. Ugh. Yes. Yeah, and we can actually utilize the assets that we've created in the metaverse, or wow. you could use them as mm -hmm. NFTs, for example, or any type of digital asset. And uh, yeah, it's it's a cross kind of platform type of Love thing. Love it. And, yeah. and I think it's good to know the, the Ritzy asset is actually a real place that we uh, captured using LiDAR and photogrammetry and brought into the stage. And as Annie pointed out, we can then bring that into some version of the
the metaverse. Just yes, wild. For VR, you can like walk around in it, you know, that sort of thing. Don't it's forget, great. questions for Annie and her amazing team on the West Coast. Just drop them in the chat over there to the right, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can. But first, back to Priscilla Thompson at uh, the University of Texas at Arlington. You're with a student who has a question for Annie and her team. Is that right, Priscilla? Yeah, I've got Gerardo Perez here. He was super captivated by that presentation. A junior here, super into gaming. What's your question? Um, how is the use of virtual reality and gaming engines different than the use of CGI in movies? Uh, that is a fantastic question, actually. Um, so they are different. Uh, so uh, what we just showed you is done all in real time. Mm -hmm. um, and so the game engine uh, uh, technology allows you to do all these changes in real time. Now, the thing is, though, that the quality of the imagery is not necessarily as good as what you would get with a traditional visual effects process. But the traditional visual effects process where you're adding in maybe like a CG dinosaur, for example, into a scene, um, that's actually a very long tail process. It yeah. takes, you know, could take, you know, weeks, days, you know, to actually render something out. So that's something where you would pre-render it and then you would composite it back into the, the shot. So they are two different processes, so I'm glad you actually picked up on that. Um, and Game Engine is going to start getting, uh, the quality is going to start getting better and better, and there's a lot of photorealistic yeah. type stuff out there. So it, it is, but it does take a lot of power to, to run it and everything. And you need to prepare these assets ahead of time too it we're talking about it all being magic but uh, it's actually not magic you actually it's have to very build. hard yes you have to build all these assets ahead of time and plan for them we're not very good at planning anymore because we're in a very much a fix it and post mentality um, but uh, but yeah that's the um, the main thing yeah. I don't know if you want to add anything Thanks, Priscilla. I want to get to Emily Aketa while we can. She's again with us from Howard University and a student who has a question there. Hey, Emily. Howard University and a student who has a question there. Hey, Emily. Hey there, Chef. We're on the same page as you, just in awe of that presentation. Up next, we're going to be speaking to Joy Lynn Keaton, a senior here at Howard University, and she has a variety of interests, journalism, Spanish, and VR. Okay, Joy Lynn, I'll let you take it away. Hi, Annie. My question is, what are the best ways for students to gain experience with the new technology? Oh, great. Good question. Uh, I think it is to just jump right into it. Uh, I think the best way, like, you know, if you're wanting to learn to edit, you would actually create something like a short yeah. and then you would just jump in and edit it. Same thing here. Um, like we said earlier, Unreal and Unity are both game engines that are you can download for free. Um, you need to have a little bit of a more powerful computer, um, but uh, you can just do the tutorials. You can play around with it. And it's kind of a, a fun thing to do, actually, to build your own little world and then set up some cameras. You can mm -hmm. actually create your own stories actually out of it too, you know, add some audio and some, some voices on there and stuff, create your own animation. So um, I know it's crazy sounding, but yes, yeah. everyone has the access to the technology and, now. And there's so much online as far as tutorials, there's YouTube videos, um, there are schools are starting to implement this more and more. So this is a very exciting space and you're seeing a lot of education really popping up right now, including straight from uh, the manufacturers and designers of some of the software. And I would also say that uh, you should try to partner with some of your game development departments. I mean, a lot of colleges have that nowadays. Um, there's also the film department. There's mm -hmm. a lot of talk about we're, you know, working in this space too. So, you know, starting that cross collaboration across different departments um, really helps to provide some extra knowledge for those areas that you know you're not necessarily an expert in, but you can maybe rely on you know a fellow student that has that knowledge as well and collaborate together on telling a story. Andy, that was amazing. Uh, just, I want to come out there now and just start playing in your world. <laughs> Andy, Andy Chang, Tim Ciencio, Horst Starvin, thank you so much for pulling back the curtain a little bit there on some of the cutting edge technology our friends at Universal are using to make movies and television shows. Wow. Okay, thanks for joining us in this hour. You've just been seeing how video gaming technology is impacting entertainment in enormous ways. Now, learn how it's impacting news.